Welcome everyone, Dr. Thor here, get ready for Gnosis. <clears throat> well, I spoke about actually uh, reading uh, Sashi Parker, otherwise known as Sashi McLean, Shoulder McLean's daughter's book, and I have just completed that. And it's quite a fascinating story. It's almost like a murder mystery with kind of some surprise endings and information in there. Uh, so it certainly is a fascinating read. And I always like to read about life, uh, people's life stories. Where did they come from? How did they become successful? Um, these are things that are rarely talked about. And we have to be very careful of what I call situational memories, convenient memories that people make into reality uh, when they may not be that way. And of course, that is of, um, with everything in life and people want to make a sympathetic or how they see things. And uh, when you're going through publishers, publishers may actually put things in or slant your particular book in one way or another. But what is this really all about? What we're trying to investigate is not necessarily her daughter. We're trying to figure out who Shirley MacLaine is. Now, there's a few New Age uh, metaphysical, quote, occult science um, gurus or masters out there from the West. These are people that have great interest or appear in metaphysics in other areas. And of course, one of them is probably the most popular writer of modern times in this entire area is Shirley MacLaine. Personally, uh, I've never really liked her, her movies, her looks, or anything else. Her pixie little girly looks and kind of attitude with a big mouth on it, almost like a, a created character uh, for her to get into Hollywood with. Um, it's all very interesting, and uh, when you put the pieces together, um, another great apparent disappointment. Now, there's an awful lot of literature to go through with Shirley MacLaine. She has, I don't know, 10, 12 books uh, talking about all of her belief systems and so forth. And who cares, to be quite honest with you? Um, because she's rich and famous, otherwise being stupid and controlled by society, because that's what rich and famous is. She didn't get where she is today because she went against the grain. Uh, she was all part of the Hollywood system and certainly doesn't seem to criticize anybody in Hollywood, nor stand up for actresses who are molested and attacked, etc. Where are you, Shirley? Uh, yeah, here in your mansion. Oh, yeah. Seeing, seeing aliens and talking about reincarnation. And of course, everything that she talks about uh, certainly isn't new. And it was a calculated risk that paid off for her in hundreds of millions of dollars. So let's get a, uh, this is really what it's all about. And, you know, there's a lot if you want to go into every detail and look things. I mean, you could take months and years researching daily for 10 or 12 hours to look and talk. Because you got to listen to every interview. you got to read every book uh, produced by her and by others. Um, you know, what are the little stories that come up? How do we judge that? And, of course, you don't know these people, so you don't really know what went on. And, of course, um... Uh, we do to a certain degree because we have her physical writings and we have her only child. Uh, if you don't count her dog, who she writes an entire book on, yet I don't think there was an entire book written on her daughter. Matter of fact, I know there wasn't, even though she is mentioned in passing uh, in her books. We have to understand the facts that this is the reality of what's going on with um, this person. And, you know, the New Age stars, I mean, there's really a couple. <clears throat> Yuri Geller, of course, who was huge in the 70s and uh, through that and then maintained a certain stardom, particularly in Europe, which is why he um, lived most of his life in uh, England, Britain, and who now apparently has retired uh, to Israel, uh, building his museum. Now, he's um, one of these celebrities. And, of course, uh, like most people, he tends to let you down, uh, as, of course, our second biggest star is Shirley MacLaine, uh, who's come out with all these books and brought what considered New Age topics to it. 
um, which uh, I don't know if these things were considered passe or not. You got to remember in the '60s, everybody believed what she did. There are thousands and thousands of books written on this by you know real experts. Uh, reincarnation ain't new. It goes back hundreds of thousands of years um, and is something that has been looked into, written about uh, by yogis and others. Uh, and frankly, it was even in the Christian belief system initially. That was cut out later. So reincarnation is not new. It's not overly shocking. The fact that this kind of obnoxious little pixie dancer uh, comes out and writes books about it and was able to use her fame uh, to promote New Age causes so she could make lots of money with it. Because how many times are you going to write your autobiography? Now, these are generally done by people a couple of times. And it's part of the Hollywood tradition uh, that everybody writes their um, autobiography literally in their middle to late 20s because they want to write another one. And if you don't, if you wait too long, uh, you can't get the double dip money because you're going to have to write about your early years. So what you want to do is write about your later years and then talk about getting book one. I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that, but we do have to understand that that is the reality of Hollywood. I, <coughs> excuse me. I recently read a couple of books by very young actors, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost. These are guys in their late 20s who wrote about their early life. Um, but, you know, that's really not their career. But you can guarantee they're going to come out with another volume of their life work. Uh, after all, it barely takes them through their career to begin with. There's a lot more to write about. It used to be that someone would write their autobiography uh, at the end of their life and publish it as kind of a historical guidance to them and in general to make money for retirement. No more. As I said, people are writing these all the time. So let's also understand that. And of course, that's what she started off with. And she was able to talk about her life, get into the publishing world. Uh, she had a bestseller there. So there was interest in Shirley. That is. So she could then follow that up. Wow, with another autobiography? I went to the supermarket at 56 and bought apples. Uh, and I got some Kool Aid. I'm surely. It was in Malibu. And it, I could see the beach. Well, this is. What are they going to write about? So let's get real here. So even if you write numerous books, taking your life from infancy, I remember as an infant and now to 10 and then 10 to 20, you know, you can write these little series of books. You can only do it to make money so long. Then it becomes old hat. So what do you write about? Well, lots of people do. And a lot of writers uh, put their name on things, like William Shatner, who has written some books of his own. But they approach you and say, I got a science fiction book. My name is Bill Blassie. That's nice. I can't sell it. It's a good book. We put your name on it. We give you this percentage of the profits. Okay. I like money. So that's what happens with so many books. Uh, people don't write these, and if you think that anything in the world is real because someone says, yeah, I wrote it, you're, a little, you're an idiot. So, looking at this, we have a, um, a very interesting book, and I'm going to take time with this, uh, written by her daughter, which obviously was treated horribly, even if a tenth of it is true with a horrible a father who abused her on every possible level, apparently including sexually, um, to a very young child. I guess she was under 12 at the time. Um, and, of course, was just very inappropriate. And, and what appears to be the real villain of the relationship here was her father, who she was left with 90% of the time. So... This is a real problem who turns out to be a complete con man and flake. Um, and it is important to note because all this ties in with Shirley MacLaine and her life. And um, uh, people may think that she somehow uh, made it on her own and was a poor little kid. Him and, her and her little pretty boy brother who I think has no talent whatsoever. Um, 
She, of course, claimed, Shirley MacLaine, that she was a dancer since two. Well, you can't dance when you're two. And you don't practice when you're two. You're way too young. These are overshots. She thinks she really forged her way in life and had no help whatsoever except a family that paid for everything, got her into schools and elsewhere. And if she was dancing at two, it wasn't from her choice. It was because family pushed her into it, making her a career, because that's how she started off. Uh, coming from a upper middle class family of showbiz people, people who were into the arts and uh, made sure they got their child into it, which is very typical. She never, ever worked a real job. Remember that as we go through this story. Never, ever. Never got a real job. Always worked, played, danced, and got lots of money for being a cutesy little pie. Uh, how quality of a dancer she was on. Well, I'm not, again, I'm not a dancing fan, and I don't consider these things to be all that great, uh, but obviously dancing is a skill like anything else. So, But it's something that um, uh, having a, uh, a kind of a gay father who was into, uh, basically he was gay, um, who was into dancing and all these 40 brats that, oh, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, oh, I want to be a dancer. Yeah, why don't you do a real job? Uh, so the whole idea is that I don't really find that as something I find interesting. And uh, while Fred Astaire certainly is uh, fun to watch uh, for five or ten minutes, after that it's uh, kind of boring. So the whole idea is that, uh, but that's a personal preference. But the point is, we get into this this uh, young girl. We have to go, you know, it all blends into what Shirley MacLaine did. She met this guy, Steve Parker, who at the time was an actor. Um, we really don't know what he did, but apparently he was an actor then. They bumped into each other. He was a producer, a businessman, a con man. Uh, it alludes in her book, and I'm not sure if the other one stated, that uh, his family had money. To a certain extent, it was established in Japan. There's this whole Japan stuff that is very clouded <clears throat> of what he was doing there and how he was conning people there, etc. But there seemed to have been some sort of business things going on there. And, of course, this is uh, fairly soon after the war where Japan was extremely cheap. You could live there like a millionaire for a uh, little bit of money. And, of course, uh, like most of these countries, you could have numerous slaves and everything else uh, there for pennies. Um, so <clears throat> she states that she was placed on a plane at two years old which, um, to go to Japan and to be with her father um, by herself which is fairly shocking in general. Apparently, the flight attendants took care of her, which generally they do, and who can't, who could refuse such a young child like that who must have been in a state of panic. But it's all about Shirley. I got a career. I'm not going to have that suppressed because my parents, who were rich middle-class people, couldn't go into show business because they had real jobs, which I never had. That was her answer to that. So get rid of the kid. Now, why did she have a kid? Now, first of all, she married the Steve Parker guy after knowing him for a day or so. They went and got married because it fitted her agenda. It fitted her agenda that she knew that she was going to be a cutesy pie in Hollywood. And, of course, she seemed to love um, all of the people who were known to be sexual offenders, like Hitchcock, who she thought was wonderful and would never criticize him, yet he was known to uh, hit on everybody, and uh, he was known as a sexual offender all the time. You don't hear about that, and there's so many other ones uh, out there as well that you think, like uh, Stanley Kubrick, who was nothing but a little horn dog. I mean, it's really upsetting that these rich and famous people uh, can't get either prostitutes or figure out how to take care of their sex lives because they marry dead, vacuous women who do nothing. It's part of the problem, of course. So their, uh, their wives are not taking care of them. Never known a guy who was looking at other women who was taken care of. Uh, they're all not taken care of. But she wanted to do that. She wanted to have the excuse to tell everybody, Oh, I'm married with a kid. You know, don't look at me like a showgirl. So she could get out of that because her life seems to be a life of uh, living alone, 
Uh, at the very least, she's asexual, if she's not homosexual. Uh, we just don't know uh, to do that. But certainly, she's never been interested in having a relationship. And she said this from day one, that she married this guy because he was looking for something similar. And um, he obviously had her number as a delusional, easily manipulated person or understood that there was some business agreement going on here. We can never take what's straightforward here. So it fitted into her reality of having a hubby and a baby, but not really. Uh, don't bother me. I can wear the wedding ring, keep people away. I can't get involved. I'm married. I got to go talk to my kid. Can't be involved in your partying. Or uh, made it easier to be possibly, and as I said, I have no idea, but um, at the very least, she is asexual never being with men, and even claiming to be the mascot of the famous Rat Pack of Sinatra, Martin, etc., that she was the mascot. And uh, she was looked upon that. And being the pixie haircut and the goofy little childlike face she has, maybe this is true, I don't particularly believe it, but uh, they took her in as a dancer for a little girly to play with in terms of she would run errands and so forth. So she claims. I have no idea. Certainly, they were not guys that were very hard up, so they didn't really need her. I don't uh, sexually when you have fifty women that you can basically. Most of these guys are known for betting multiple women at the same time, so you know we all know that's how women are. You got fame; they they're uh, pretty much their knees touch their ears. So the whole idea is that um, this is how things go. So who knows what the true story there, but she was because she did a movie with Martin and Lewis. She was able to get into this crowd, make sure she got into that crowd because they were numero uno, and this was all part of her career. She did several movies. I guess she's an okay actress. Never really liked her, her personality, her goofy look. Personally, I never found anything there. But apparently Hollywood rewarded her. And they rewarded her from day one. She went from stage plays and the ballet, which mommy and daddy paid for, uh, to being discovered very quickly uh, by Hollywood and signed contracts. As I said, never had a real job. Always made money in Hollywood. Never starved anywhere. Never lived with a whole bunch of other actors. Uh, never had a problem making money, basically, and always was able to do it. Now, you can always tell a person, and one of the problems I have with everyone, particularly when it comes to the bleeding heart liberals, the new agers, is I hear the same kind of 60 cry attitude. Take care of the environment. We need to love the planet. And they screw over their entire family. I had this with brothers who were 60s brats who stole everything they possibly could and actually put their mother on the street. Yet they want to help the poor. And, of course, Shirley MacLaine is the same kind of crybaby. They want to have these, quote, bleeding heart liberal policies, uh, yet not when it comes to the money out of their pocket. They want the money out of your pocket. And you can always tell a person by their way they treat and handle money. I had the same thing happen just recently with the so-called uh, doper shaman uh, who we're publishing, who... Um, wants to make sure he steals every penny he can from us. And when he's told, look, that's not going to happen, uh, gets nasty. Yeah, is that what ayahuasca brought you, you scumbucket? Well, most of you ayahuasca people are scumbuckets, including your big later, Terrence McKenna, who's a CIA agent and uh, helped them torture people with drugs. I'm such a... Let's break away from society. Mm. As long as I get lots of money from you. Uh, so the whole idea is that uh, we, we run into those things that uh, happen out there, and we need to understand this. I mean, this is the issue we're talking about. So these are not off-the-subject ramblings. This is part of what we're talking about. We're talking about why do we give a damn about her and uh, Shirley MacLaine in general? Well, there's lots of movie stars. I mean, there's a lot of crybaby ones. <laughs> George Clooney, um, who married an Arab lawyer uh, and uh, lives out of the country, uh, and cries about social issues, and she's a social issue uh, issue lawyer, um, and that's how they met, I assume. Um, cries about all these issues, yet he gave eight million dollars, one million to eight different friends as gifts. That's how much money he has. 
And these were other movie stars that didn't need the money. What's in your head, man? I mean, how insulting is that? Yeah, yeah, that's the crowd you want to be in. But when you really get down to it, you find out how rotten they are. So the whole idea is that when we move into these areas, we find out explicitly what is going on uh, of what this fake, fake New Ager is. Uh, as I said, I don't think anything she says. She's really not brung, brought out any kind of, quote, secret-like information, things we haven't heard of, things we don't know, uh, talking about issues. She skirts around the whole extraterrestrial unit when she basically... Um, when it comes down to in the big uh, shoe dropping of this book, which I will discuss here, is the fact that she believes that her first husband, Steve Parker, was an alien. He gave her a book that of the two worlds or something. It's a famous book about, um, about aliens living on two worlds. And of course, it's convenient for her to believe that, but it goes into some deep, shocking information here. Um... And that's what this book is all about. Kind of a fascinating book when you get to it. You think it's about this particular uh, child, then, then you get to the shoe dropping at the end of it, which is pretty staggering that somebody could be this ignorant and buffoonish as Shirley MacLaine was, while ignoring everybody else. <laughs> and I'm going to get into that. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, and I do recommend everybody read uh, her book if you want to uh, do. You can get it on Kindle. There'll be a link uh, down below. That's how I got it. But um, and you can Kindle books. You can generally uh, you can play them to you. You don't have to read them. You can listen to them if you want to. And she I don't know if she has an audio book or not. But this is a way of getting audio books. Tend to be expensive, but you can get the service through Amazon inexpensively uh, if you want them. But it's certainly you can have any Kindle book read to you, or almost all of them. So the bottom line is that what does that mean <laughs> so, as we move into all this stuff? But here she is, and um, her father was a nasty little jerk. Uh, he was a con man. He was, um, uh, they had already set up. I don't, but, you know, it's hard to criticize him for certain sexual behavior in terms of the fact of having a sex partner in Japan because he didn't have one there. Shirley was out doing whatever she was doing. Uh, whether that was involving tacos or hot dogs, I am unsure uh, of. But she was busy and she was going to have her career regardless. I mean, she said this in interviews. She said nothing was going to stop her from having her career. And that means her child. Why well, have one then? I just covered that. It's an out for her. I'm a mommy. Don't harass me. So I made sure that fitted in. It probably fitted in with her father because now he had a meal ticket. You know, she had to be supported, and of course she was going to send some money, whatever that was. But it didn't really seem to be any child support involved. It seemed to be something that he arranged this whole fraud, uh, which is uh, discussed in this book, which is pretty fascinating. But there are serious problems, as I said, getting back to money. And one of the problems here, on top of everything else, I could spend hours talking about this book, and I'm not really... Uh, I don't think anybody really cares. Uh, this is going to go on fairly long because there's a lot to cover, but uh, I could go into all the different things. But the bottom line is, is that she, with her multi, multi millions, right up uh, into her late teens and early 20s, never gave her child a thing. Didn't support her. The minute she turned 17, they yanked all of her money, basically. Wouldn't pay for her college. And gee, I know how that is. Uh, I had the same problem in my family. But it was the same thing. Nothing was ever paid for. Anything I ever got, I got from my mother's grandmother, her mother. And that was it. Everything was purchased there. Never got a dime from my so-called father. Uh, who was up to him wouldn't even have bought toys on Christmas. And if it wasn't for my mother getting a Sears card so she could buy toys, we would have had nothing. So the whole idea is that um, all of these things are part and parcel of the kind of scum people are. And you can always tell a person by money. Because money comes down to your core survival and belief systems. So if you are a person who acts like that, that's who you are. And everything else really has no value. 
Uh, you're a little going to church and believing in reincarnation, all the other things that go on with people are meaningless because it has nothing to do with it. Just like all New Agers and really come down to it. Uh, and I could go on for hours of New Agers' hypocritical actions. Um, uh, are all based in greed. They're not trying to do the right thing. They want money in their pocket and not yours, even if they have a lot of it. And rich people, I've, I've known lots of rich people, and they're all evil scum buckets. They help nobody. Uh, they abuse people constantly. They want to get the cheapest deal on everything. And they want slave labor, which is how all of the poor people were brought into this country. And, of course, the massive amounts of Mexicans that uh, invaded America uh, were allowed to happen so the rich people could have slave labor. And that who couldn't bitch. Pretty evil. And that's the system they supported. So. Understanding all that, people aren't their culture, there aren't anything else. They're their dollar bill. That's what they are. The fact that a bunch of rich people would bring in people of alien societies to uh, raise their children uh, goes back to a long time. goes back to the South who had wet nannies or black women who suckled the babies. So these babies were brought up on black women's uh, breast milk. Because the uh, rotten southern rich bitches, of course, wouldn't even take care of their own children. And we can see what happens to the South today with the kind of psychotic evil people there. So the whole idea is that uh, when we get into all that stuff, it's very interesting to understand that. So here we go with a two-year-old on a plane going to Japan and um, uh, the subsequent uh, bizarre relationship with this Steve Parker guy. Uh, who, again, um, uh, whatever people's sexuality, as long as it's between consenting adult, adults, uh, doesn't matter the sexes or what you're doing or anything else, that's up to you. But he didn't have a wife. So what was he do? He got himself a Japanese slave who was a matey type woman who had another, no other prospects in life who he took care of. Because what he was supposed to do? for his sexual and other needs, she certainly wasn't going to fill it. She certainly is not a sexual person in any way whatsoever. As a matter of fact, she runs from that. She made sure she put herself as a cute little kitty girl with the little pixie haircut and, I'm just a little one. I mean, she's really got a revolting personality. Um... So that was all set up that way. So it's not really it would be odd uh, that, um, there, that he would have a mistress. But, of course, to a young child, seeing there's no mother and obviously knowing, and they tried to hide it to some degree, apparently, um, which is kind of ridiculous, but obviously this was his bedmate, and she would sleep with him every night and then get up early in the morning and slip out so his child didn't see it, whatever that meant. I mean, it's just the stupidity of that is just unbelievable. But, of course, you're in a, you are in a totally foreign society. And, of course, being as young as she was, she picked up the language easily. But she's a, an odd one out there. She also was then trying to be indoctrinated by nannies. She had a nanny during the day only and then was left at home alone at night. I don't know if that was six... Six, five, six o'clock. He would go partying every night out to bizarre different clubs and everything else, which uh, Japan is known for, um, and leave her alone with by herself. And you're talking about a girl um, who is, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years old as well. So you can imagine how traumatizing is being in a house alone. Now, she did have nannies during the day, but that doesn't matter. It means that for half today, 10 to 12 hours, she was left entirely alone. She had a few friends, but you've got to remember that she was not Japanese. Her nanny tried to make her Japanese, uh, and of course beat into her subservience and all the things that Japanese do to their kind of bizarre uh, sexless women that they are. That's why they have millions of sex dolls in Japan, because the women don't have any sexuality whatsoever. So, um, when you get into all those things, that's what you run into uh, in terms of what's going on. But um, the Japanese culture is quite different. I've spent time in Japan and the way they perceive the world. Um, and, of course, he didn't try and make things better for her. He didn't communicate with her well. He didn't see her. Basically, he put her down all the time. Because of her strange situation and where she was, she had fairly poor grades. 
So uh, in his mind, her father, uh, he used to call her the idiot and said that, well, you're so stupid, you'll never learn, and even prevented her apparently from reading because it was a waste of time. You're too ignorant to understand what's in books, although he read all the time apparently and had a fairly extensive library. But his nickname for her was the idiot. Well, that's nice to grow up with, isn't it? Uh, put down uh, constantly for an, a, a person who's in a fragile position. Uh, so, um, of course, it was difficult for her to make friends, and they pushed somebody on her that she wasn't too crazy about, and she had kind of a little Japanese friend, girlfriend, and that was part of her relationship. But again, she was not there in the nighttime. So she stayed at home every night alone in a place. And um, I don't think there was even TV back then. You gotta remember TV is a phenomena of the 60s, basically. Um, and not, I guess that's around her time. But I mean, there wasn't. And if it was TV there, it was all in Japanese and kind of the odd shows that they do have there. So it certainly wasn't American TV. It's not the internet. It's not satellite time. Things like this haven't happened except in the last five to ten years, believe it or not, that you can go anywhere in the world and kind of see American network TV. So... Here you are all alone as a little child and basically no friends and a uh, father who is extremely disrespectful and unsupportive of you. He wouldn't buy her anything either. So, uh, here we go again. Wouldn't spend a penny on her. Well, after all, she was just a tool and to be used. So, the whole idea is that he had lots of bizarre um, ways of acting, including... Uh, the fact that he tended to be a nasty, violent person and beat up his mistress on numerous occasions and treated her like the slave she was because that's what these kind of robber baron ugly Americans did in a lot of these situations because they're able to have slaves. And of course, that's what this Japanese woman was. So, and she witnessed this on several occasions. Um... I don't know was it because of the Japanese lifestyle or not, uh, but he was frequently naked. And this is something um, that he would constantly do, which is uh, pretty unknown to Westerners. Now, Japanese nudity is quite different than their, have their bath culture where everybody sees everybody naked. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's also a lot of humping that goes around in these bathhouses. Now, it's considered in communities that this was good because then you never know who was actually the father of a particular child, which means the community tended to take care of each other better because after all, that could be your kid. So there are these types of things, but certainly inappropriate for a Western girl who went home every summer for a few weeks uh, and spent time in the Western world where none of this is allowed. And certainly Shirley MacLaine would seem to be so sexually oppressed in terms of her personal life that it wasn't funny, even though she hang around uh, supposedly with sex gurus of the 60s and other things when it was free love and free drugs, but it didn't seem like she got to involve in that. There wasn't any uh, talk of that per se. But the kind of neglect and abuse here is just staggering. But I think a lot of people go through this. Uh, I think a lot of parents uh, don't really give a damn about anybody else. That's how they are with the world in general. And while they want to save the whales, they don't really give a damn about their own children. So um, this is a situation that happened. So he was constantly uh, showing his genitalia, constantly doing it. But as you said, to a certain extent, that is kind of Japanese. I don't know. Um, but it became more and more affrontive when he started to spoon her and they slept together in bed. And I think she was about 10 at this time. Not sure. It's hard. to. I'm not going to sit there and go back over these. Does, does it matter? Well, let's not get into it. You know, I get this on uh, YouTube. Well, it was actually, he was 10 years old, not 11. I'll stick it where the sun don't shine. So the whole idea is that it doesn't matter. He was spooning her naked, sticking his cock between her legs, and maybe even molesting her. We apparently don't know. Uh, apparently, she talks about her losing her virginity, uh, which includes her hymen. So apparently, there wasn't any direct penetration in her uh, vagina, apparently, and whether he um, 
orgasm between her legs or bottom or whatever who knows but it's inappropriate to be like that and of course uh, that is not a way that people should be sleeping naked to people per western again uh, you know you can look at these things as you want but this is a fragile child that you call an idiot anyway uh, so the whole idea, and she was afraid, as she's been in her entire life, apparently, being a very submissive woman, giving in to every type of sexual advance, every problem. I mean, this is a woman who never, ever fought for anything, claiming that this was beat into her by her nanny to be a submissive Japanese girl. And of course, this is true, and that is part of the Japanese culture. Um, while the men are very macho, uh, the women are expected to act like that. So maybe that was part of it, maybe not. But the bottom line is that uh, this is the kind of things that went on consistently. And she saw her mother infrequently um, whenever she could spare the time. And apparently during the, quote, summer, she would go and spend time with her mother uh, wherever she was, depending on what's going on. And this is, it's hard to say how long that was, but um, I've heard is, uh, it says summers. That, uh, I assume that means the three summer months. Then I've heard weeks. How do you figure all this out? But she did have this time with her mother, which was fairly good, but the mother never gave her much of anything. Uh, sometimes she would buy her clothes as a child, but she would soon grow out of these clothes uh, when she went back to Japan, and they would never uh, get her proper clothes. Her father wouldn't spend a dime on her. So her mother did spend some of the money on her as a child to do what pretty much you have to. I mean, she didn't have anything. It would probably look bad if her kid was uh, running around with goodwill clothing on her. Um, but let's get real here. She uh, fitted her into her career as it suited her. And when she was done with her conversations or put enough energy into her child, well, I have other things to do. And again, is this an issue of money or other? No, this is an ego thing. She wanted to be successful in a movie star at any cost. And the cost really was destroying the life of her daughter because she doesn't have the capacity or the wisdom or the understanding and of course, just like all the other people she hangs around with, um, you know, the dummy lama, all these gurus, all the people that really don't preach anything of much value uh, except sentimental stupidity that makes you feel warm and fuzzy when you screw over your own family. Um, so it goes on and on uh, with her story. And of course, when she reached 12, she was, uh, um, a lot of this is a typical story of rich people other than an abusive father, that they don't have time for you, they're busy, uh, you're left alone with nannies. I mean, this is not a new story for Hollywood or rich people. Um, you're left alone with nannies. Um, people like Angelina Jolie apparently has three nannies per kid. Well, she has hundreds of millions of dollars. But what I'm saying is that who's doing that? They, they like to lie, telling, oh, I make sandwiches for the kids before school. Yeah, you liar. I mean, this is such nonsense. Or maybe that's their big parenting job for the deed. They take 20 minutes to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. After all, they do hire full-time chefs. They have nannies up the gazoo. I mean, it's amazing. So this is not unusual. It's not like there's a lot of time spent with people. And this is also something that's been perpetrated by, the, I mean, the British are notorious for sending their kids to schools, boarding schools, where boarding schools means that you sleep there. You're not with your family. It means you form a family with who is ever around you. A lot of these boarding schools are very perverse places, as the famous occultist Alistair Crowley can tell you, because they're mixing 10-year-olds in with 15-year-olds, and there's nothing but sodomy going on. Uh, this is to be expected when you mix, and of course not to mention the prolific um, desire of the British-German race and their homosexuality that they're famous for. So um, it needs to be fully understood that that's the reality of it. So rich kids have had been shuffled off to boarding schools, and I don't know if it was Switzerland or wherever she was sent, but one of the amazing things is this book kind of reads like a fantasy, and one thing I'm kind of surprised at is how lucky she was, considering she was put into horrible situations, which could have turned out to, to, to cost to her even life. Uh, she was abandoned in many places. One of those was nobody picked her up at the end of her um, private school. And you have to wonder what's going on here. The private school um, 
is not making sure their students are taken care of. They're not making sure that uh, they're calling their parents and have arranged for people to be. Apparently not. Oh, school's out. Bye bye. We're locking the doors. Everybody out. And she was standing there alone. Uh, and eventually uh, crying, and some uh, schoolmate uh, uh, saw her that, and um, that she didn't know very well, or even at all, and said, well, come with me, you can be with my family. Well, I never had that kind of things happen to me, on any level whatsoever. But of course, this is very typical of the school environment, with the kind of idiocy and scum that a teacher is, that this entire school didn't make sure that their students were taken care of emotionally. Uh, so this person, but this is a story with her all the time. She went with that person for a month or two, and then she said, I can't be a freeloader anymore, and told them a lie, and was left in a Yugoslavian train station, stating to them that, uh, I've got the money, there's no problem, bye. Well, what kind of a psychotic thing is that to do? So she ends up sitting in some restaurant somewhere crying. No kidding. And, of course, some little farmer sees her, takes her in, and then keeps her for several months, uh, treating her wonderfully until she can somehow get in contact with Mommy and get some money. But Mommy never gave her any money to any great extent. She has millions. Millions. So, I'm going to speed all this up. I can go into all these things. This is very typical. First of all, the most important issue here is that Mommy never paid for anything. She didn't, when she reached 17 and wanted to go to college so she could get better jobs in general, uh, Mommy uh, said no. She had no intentions of paying for it. Yet Mommy and Daddy and his, in her life paid for everything of hers, including her going to dancing school endlessly so she could tweet her little feet instead of getting a real job. And she somehow thought that she worked hard for it because somebody gave her everything and she had to follow through by doing the actual work of dancing. Tough job, isn't it? Just like it was tough for like, football and basketball and baseball players who basically lived their childhood for another 40 years. Yeah, it's a tough life, isn't it? And who supported you through that? As I've stated, Shirley McLean never ever had a real job. She didn't have dry parts in Hollywood and she didn't have to do that because mommy and daddy took care of her so she could dance, dance, dance. So the whole idea is that um, this reality. So that was another thing that happened, and her father refused to as well. And it isn't that expensive to send somebody to school, and even if it is, so what? That's your responsibility as a parent, and they categorically refuse. And of course, Shirley McLean says, you got to go make something of yourself. I did that. You know, here they have, and I've seen this from so many people, the convenient memory they have of how mommy and daddy took care of them through their entire way. And even if they didn't, why should you have your children go through the same stress that you went through? Makes no sense. You're supposed to help your children. Give them good starts because you went and braved the world and now you can make it easier for them so their transition from childhood into adulthood can be much better. So, and of course, Sachi here, that's her daughter's name, um, of course was traumatized by Who wouldn't? The stories go on endlessly and almost hard to believe. Set up weddings. She never talks about anything. She gets in a quasi engagement with some Australian guy, goes to his farm, and of course she doesn't like what's going on there, but never opens her mouth and has, of course, no money. And this is a way you control people. Uh, she was able to uh, get a bit of money uh, to get a car so she could escape from the outback uh, to Sydney uh, and get away from this guy who was semi-abusive, but uh, there just was nothing there. And apparently was a friend of her father's, like they were setting her up as a whore or other things. It was uh, kind of very strange here. And the stories are so connected as almost a conspiracy type thing that it's hard to believe some of these things. Uh, she goes into Sydney and then she uh, becomes a with no money. How did that happen? I guess she had a little bit of money. She was a waitress or something. She couldn't afford a car, which was $500, but maybe she could afford money to hang around the Qantas stewardess place to become a stewardess. Apparently, she was able to do that and uh, was uh, got the job as a stewardess, but she must have had some money to do How did she survive? These things are not talked about. I don't like holes like that. You know, getting by is tough, and this is what holds people in a lot of uh, situations. What do you do? You don't have the money. 
plain and simple. So the bottom line is, is that um, uh, you get these kind of stories from her, which are, um, but she's lucky. She gets a job here. She gets a job there. People give her a job as a waitress. You know, she's always to get by. She gets a job as a waitress, and then one of the waitresses she moves in with because she doesn't have the money for apartment. God, what luck. I don't know. Does this happen all the time? Maybe I don't know about these things. Um, but everybody takes her in. Everybody helps her, of course, except her parents. Now, I don't know. A lot of times people do this because, hey, I'm a movie star's daughter. And people like that. And they tend to help you because uh, they feel you're special. And they should help you because you're special. So she certainly was able to milk that to the umpth degree. And I believe it was three, or three, or three to five years of it being a stewardess for Qantas. And um, and she didn't do, do bad in her later life to kind of sum her up. And we'll get into the biggest issue here. Um, so needless to say, and then, of course, uh, she made a commercial with her mother uh, for Diet Pepsi, which she kind of pushed her mother to do because her mother didn't really want to do commercials. And she screamed, I don't need the money. I don't even drink that Diet Pepsi shit. Um, so uh, by the end of it, she got her mother to go through with it, and they paid her a million dollars to do that commercial. Guess what she got? But again, she should have been on the contract. She should have been a little smarter. Um, basically, when you and I've signed these contracts, I actually did a few commercials myself. They pay you. And she should have been on there. But I'm assuming it only Shirley was on there, and they overrode her. She should have been a little smarter that she would have got her money out of it. But again, should you have to do that with mommy? Well, when you got a little turd of a mommy like this little dancing redheaded freak, you should not only do that, you should make sure you're carrying a gun. So the whole idea is that that's the way life goes. So the point is that she screwed him out of that money as well. She did get some acting parts on her own, apparently with no help from Mommy. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, Hollywood is a tough place to go. And um, maybe if Mommy helped a little, she would have done a little better. But she did get several parts in some big movies, mostly because she was Shirley MacLaine's daughter, and Hollywood tends to do that. But it doesn't mean you're going to get on the payroll. But uh, Shirley could have got her a job as an assistant, uh, so many things. That's how Hollywood and most good jobs work. You think she could have gotten her a good job at the very least. But her idea was to go make it on your own like I did. Yeah, well, I've, as I said, I've heard this before. She made it on her own as much as um, Donald Trump's kid makes it on his own. Um, so she went through all these jobs and uh, she did things. And she finally married fairly well. She married a top business executive, moved to Texas, and had a couple of kids with him. And, of course, I'm assuming her life is made now. Um, and she is getting, uh, I don't know if she's getting alimony, but she certainly is getting child support for as long as they are. But she certainly did that. She did divorce this guy, so I don't know what's going on, which required her to probably be in the need of money. Now, you write books like this for only one reason. You're either very, or two reasons. You're either extremely embittered by it, and you want people to know that, you know, hey, don't look at this dancing redheaded monkey face as some uh, fun-loving movie star. She's actually a bad person, and uh, she treated me bad, and the world should know. Uh, when And she had nothing to lose. Why? Well, the other reason you do stuff like this is for the buckolas, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You wouldn't do it for the buckolas as mommy would have given her her fair share of that commercial, at least 50%, which would have been $500,000. And back then, that was equivalent probably to $5 million today. She probably wouldn't have need to have written a book. Now, people who write books like this do it for those two reasons. And usually, the second reason of needing money is paramount to why you do it. Because it doesn't necessarily help your life uh, in terms of your day-to-day -day living life. Going on TV shows, having to talk about this brings up a lot of old memories, which are very toxic. Uh, unless you're going to get a benefit from this, which you do from the money, it's really not worth it. Unless you've been horribly treated. And of course, there's both here. Uh, and, of course, her mother would come out and said, well, this is all lies. What do you expect that kind of fake, New Ager, self-centered prune to actually say? 
Well, certainly, there's no verification from Shirley MacLaine that she gave any money. Let's get down to recordable facts. You know, a lot of things can be contrived, and, well, you misinterpreted it, tried to be a good mommy. Well, you failed, if you tried or not. But, you know, we can all look at that and say, well, who's right or wrong? But, of course, this case seems to be pretty open and shut. I mean, this person has been abandoned most of her life and had no parental thing, and this is what really messes your head up. And, of course, it's difficult meaning to have relationships past that with anybody. Um, but we know Shirley got over that because she wrote a book about her dog. Oh, you know, dogs are slaves, and theoretically, uh, you can do anything you want with a dog. So, get rid of it, hit it in the head with a bat, kill it on the spot, feed it whatever shit you want to give it. They're slaves. And, you know, they're good slaves. Because they don't take offense to it. And they just want love and affection and they'll be with you. And that's it. So, you know, this is the lowest type of relationship you can have because dogs are so loving and giving. And that goes for almost any animals. And, of course, that's the only relationship Shirley could really deal with. Except for her nonsense about New Age stuff and astronauts and all the other things. I should say, uh, it just, it just, uh, it's just obscene when you hear people talk like this. Uh, and then they claim to be, and she's about as enlightened as the Donald Trump is. She's just the exact same uh, turd uh, that he is, except she's spouting New Age and he spouts garbage from his uh, privileged reality. So, when we look at all these things, we need to quite understand that. So, the point is, she wrote this because she probably needed the money. And I don't know how much you make on a book like this, but whatever. I mean, there certainly is interest here. I bought it years later. This was published about 10 years ago. Um, she made some money from it. Hopefully, it was enough to get her by and keep her going, maybe. Um, and this is uh, important for people uh, so that they go. Money is critical. So how she's making money today, we don't know. I don't know if her ex-husband has taken care of her because of their children. You know, that's sort of real. But if that was Shirley MacLaine, she would say, screw you, I'm not giving you a dime. I don't care whose kids you have. But the bottom line is, is that there is no reason for her to do that. Shirley MacLaine, with all her new agey stuff, is nothing more than like everybody else. She's a money whore. She lives in mansions. She meets celebrities. She goes to five-star restaurants, hotels, and drives super expensive cars. If that's new age thinking, well, then pass me up on it. She's just a... Uh, a typical money grabber, as I've stated, there's no difference between her and any other rich sum. Except, oh, I believe in this. Does she really believe in all this? Is any of this really tied in? Or is it really coming down to the fact that this is the way she makes money? And she's made a lot of money. And we'll talk about that as well. But what it came down to is apparently here's the shoe dropping of what happened with the story here, which is kind of out of the blue. I didn't really expect this by reading this book. And the point is it comes down to the fact that uh, one day when she was with her mother in Malibu, she brought out a box of telegrams uh, that she had been getting stating that her father was actually this uh, alien up in space or somehow connected to the U.S. military. It's hard to figure out what you're really talking about here. And um, for him to continue his mission, which I guess is, a, you know, I don't know if she's trying to pay the U.S. government. The U.S. government has a lot of money. <laughs> they steal from their public. I'm not sure, but if this was an alien who apparently could transverse space, he was unable to make the buckaroos. <laughs> Here it goes. It's hard to believe anybody would buy this, especially a spoiled little brat like Shirley. So I wonder about what this story really means. So she had to fund him. And this funding was $60,000 a month. A month. A month. Well, she didn't even take care of her daughter. You know, you didn't really have to spend that much to take care of somebody. You know, three or four grand, especially back in the times we're talking about, would be a hell of a lot of money. And certainly she had it. And but she made sure she grabbed every penny she could. But she had no problem supporting this loser guy who she was convinced was actually, so the story goes, an alien. 
and that this guy in uh, in Japan um, was kind of a clone or a stand-in father, but the real guy was this astronaut that was up there, and he needed money to keep going, and he gave her this little book about space people, and apparently she bought into it. Now, this story is very hard to understand, I should say to buy. She did have these, apparently, from the real astronaut who sent her telegrams stating uh, who he was and uh, that he uh, and talked about their daughter. Now, was she that insane? What is really going on here? What is this bizarre relationship about? Why did she really never have any relationships? And right to this day, she has no partner that we know of. What is all that stuff? So why as she was denying and allowing her daughter to have nothing pursuing her career, she was sending what is a fortune to somebody monthly so he could live and have yachts and mansions and have a opulent lifestyle living on her money. Uh, now apparently this finally came to an end. I think it had anything to do with the fact except that she just didn't want to pay anymore. They tried to intermingle that she found out. It, she didn't think he had a mistress? Come on. Maybe she's asexual or possibly homosexual, but certainly he wasn't. So the point is, does he really expect him to do that? So, and especially having all that money, living in a foreign country, and all of that goes with it. But, you know, we have really problems. You know, I have problems with all researchers and everything else. She claims to have so much wisdom, and she gives huge amounts of credit to the bizarre stories the Japanese come up with, which is they don't know where they're from. Nobody really knows. Everything from Japan has come from China, including their bodies. This is known. There's not a single thing that's Japanese that doesn't come from Japan. They have modified it. I mean, come from China uh, into Japan. They have modified it to some degree, but it all connects to China. Plain and simple, everything the Japanese do. She claims that they don't know and they come from Mars, you know, like those elusive white Japanese they claim they have. Well, what does that mean? How can you be a white Japanese? It doesn't even make sense. Uh, whether there were some tribes of uh, Caucasians or uh, Celtics that went up in uh, these areas and may have had some offspring, well, this seems to be real as they found red-haired people in China graves. Uh, but that really has nothing to do with it. She glosses over the thousands of years of brutal history of the Japanese have, including murdering 20 million people just in World War II alone. But they've been butchering people in Asia all alone, and they've been butchering. And that's only the Chinese. They have butchered hundreds of millions of people, the Japanese have. And they're a very psychotic race, uh, and people want to ignore this for whatever their personal reasons are. So that's her great research. She thinks she knows how great the Japanese are. And if they are extraterrestrials, well, this is just another reason to make sure we meet any extraterrestrial uh, with a gun pointed at their head. So we have all these problems in it. So this is the thing that came out. While she didn't get any money, her for over, I think it was almost 30 years, she was paying him tens of thousands of dollars a month. And uh, this was at least $60,000 a month for at least 15 or 20 years. And while there was never any money to send her to college and she refused to pay for anything. And, you know, these things could be verified. If you spent so much, surely, let's see all of that. Why was she unable to go to college? So the point is, there's always an excuse, oh, well, you're not smart enough. Well, you know, most people that go to college aren't very smart. And you don't have to take physics when you go to college. And this is another misnomer that a lot of people don't understand, including myself. At the time. You don't have to go to college and take something that's difficult. Most people get goofball degrees. I've known people who got degrees in um, Haitian history. They have a master's degree. What the hell is that? It's ridiculous. This is the kind of things you can do in college. It's very, very easy, and that's how you get your degree. Most college people are stupid. Now, there certainly are the engineering, the science students, and this requires a certain uh, ability to do mostly math. And if you're good at math, you can get through all of the sciences. You don't have to be very bright either. But apparently she was uh, good and she picked up several languages in some areas and this should have been something she did as a profession and did. They hired her at Qantas because she spoke, I believe, French and Japanese. 
So this was pretty good uh, that you had somebody like that. I'm assuming the average Aussie uh, did not speak French or Japanese. They spoke Aussie, might. So the whole idea is that uh, this is the kind of things that actually uh, transpire there. So, uh, but it doesn't matter. Everybody needs to get their little degree, and by not having that really puts you in a terrible situation in life. And this is really what the parents want. They want you victimized. They want you out of the way and very controllable, so they make sure they don't do this. So they, you have no power in life, and that's how they want you. It gives them an ego boost. And, of course, one thing we can say about old Shirley is she's got a huge ego. She's got a big mouth. She gets away with it because now she's a celebrity. She got away with it before because she's a cutesy little tomboy girl. And, of course, that made her less attractive, basically, and it made her an amusement. So people looked at her like she was, the buffoonish little girl. Um, so this was the whole idea that went on. Apparently, this finally broke up and... Um, uh, she made an excuse because of the mistress or whatever. I mean, really? They already stated that they didn't want to have a traditional relationship. They had an open marriage. Why would that be the problem? But apparently, after Sashi talked with her about this and told her about what was going on there, and she came to the conclusion that maybe this astronaut is not worth paying for and stopped that and apparently got a divorce. And I don't know what the settlement was. I don't know what's going on. And all that happened. But uh, poor little Sashi here got absolutely nothing. I mean, growing up in an alien um, through your formative years in a very alien country. And believe me, Japan is extremely alien, especially in the 50s and 60s uh, or even in the 70s. You've got to remember these things. Uh, this is right after World War II. And this is very closed society to begin with. So this is very foreign, weird society. Um, so that's a strain unto itself, and she had absolutely no support being abandoned for half of the day, sitting at home alone with nothing. No even TV, no VCRs, baby. I guess they had radio, if you don't mind the clunky little uh, music you get, the dung 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 traditional Japanese music, which I happen to like. But I don't know if I want to listen to it all night. Uh, she had little or no friends. She had someone that she kind of was a friend, and uh, they did send her kind of friend with her to boarding school. So you can see there was an effort to try and give her a start, but probably only for themselves. They figured they would have less trouble with her and that she would complete boarding school if she had a quasi-friend there. So there was some of these efforts. And, of course, uh, I'm not sure if, you know, it's too little, very, very late. But there definitely wasn't any money to send your kid to Europe and then not give them money and send them money all the time, especially when you have tens of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars is inexcusable and evil. And people like this should not be given credit, just like George Clooney should be pissed on wherever he goes for blowing $8 million on his rich friends. So... Totally inexcusable that this person had nothing and had no access, didn't even give him a fair start to send him to a decent college, which would have basically cost them little or nothing. I'm sure she could have winked her little eyes and twitched her little whatever at some school administrator for some gig college and got her kitty in. Everybody wants celebrities on the uh, in their schools. I'm sure she did plenty of that to get parts. So the whole idea is that, um, and of course, never has a negative word about anybody, is one thing I've, when I've watched uh, McLean's interviews, uh, to people who are known to be scumbags of Hollywood. And she certainly didn't come out and fight for um, what was happening. And she never has. She's never going to smack Hollywood in the face because that's where she gets her money from, even though she's an old woman now uh, with no prospects of Hollywood anything. But of course, she can write lots of books and everybody is tied in. And let's get it 
clear here with Shirley. Now, this is the whole thing that happened, and nothing changed after this anyway. As I said, she screwed her daughter out of money that she deserved rightfully as half of the uh, commercial for Pepsi, and the whole idea was to have the two generations there. So it wasn't the fact that she was just bringing her kid in to make extra money. It was crucial to the commercial. She should have got 50%, and she should have made sure that that was talked about, but she never did that with her mother, and she never stood up for herself, and she's, uh, as I said, she blames that. She's had a horrible experience. Her father tried to pimp her out and use her in different ways. It was quite a horrible existence. So the real villain here is her ridiculous, um, abusive father, uh, who, of course, didn't stand up for her as well. Usually one parent stands up for the child at times. Neither of them did it because it had no value to them. She got what she wanted. I'm married with a kid. Now I'm a 60-year-old. Nobody wants me. Of course they don't want you. You pixie-haired freak. So the whole idea is that uh, once that was done, there's no use in it. So I don't know what old Parker baby is doing today, or she probably paid him off, uh, so none of this would get off. So there probably was a big settlement, but you know I'm not going to spend hours trying to find the settlement and doing that. I am going to read every one of Shirley Baby's books. I've got most of them on my Kindle now, and I'll see what she her babblings have to say. But let's remember here, as I started all this off with, of the kind of money you can make with writing and how you can't do that. Nobody wants to hear about Jack Lemon and her after writing about it once. Who cares about that crappy little movie, The Apartment? Which I believe was about kind of a hooker. She lived in the apartment and people came in and out of there and screwed her. I don't, I don't remember what it was or not. Uh, but it certainly was a horrible. I do remember watching that film once and finding it highly depressive. Uh, but the point is, is that um, nobody wants to hear that story once it's been said. So once, as I mentioned, you write your two little books on your life, you know, from a birth to 30 and then 30 to retirement, you're done. Nothing else to write. So what do you do? Well, people have written things like cookbooks, gardening books, they can write about their hobbies. A lot of people, the celebrities generally write a lot of novels, and I'm not sure they write them as I mentioned either, but they write novels about something they're famous for or in general. So this is uh, typical, and of course, publishers love that because they can slap your name on there and you can get a certain amount of sales guaranteed, I'm assuming. So none of this is on you, but what do you write about? What are your interests? Well, she decided to write about her metaphysical experiences at a time where metaphysics were still pretty big, particularly the resurgence which was going on in the middle to late 80s. Um, and of course, she tested the water. She wrote a book about this. She, of course, she wrote her first Hollywood autobiographies first. That's what came out first. It wasn't anything like this. She wasn't compelled to write about her New Age experiences. Um, so she started out, and that book sold well. And there were several people that sold well at the tent. Lynn Andrews, this was a time when, um, trying to remember her name, she got involved with a big time New Age guru. Um, what is it, Z something? I can't remember. But uh, Ramtha, the Ramtha people, she got in bed with her. Uh, they got together and propelled each other's careers. Uh, she was able to sell a lot of books because Ramtha had a great following. And Ramtha was able to ch put a big giant check mark on their publicity wall by having Shirley MacLaine as one of their people who was connected to them. Um, so this did very a great service to them both to promote their new age businesses. And Ramtha, like everything else, uh, I mean, it's an interesting organization. Uh, it turned into a money maker. She had people sell property saying the world was coming to an end and sold a fortune, from what I understand, in horses to people. Uh, so there was a horrible thing that went on there with the whole Ramtha th uh, stuff as well. But, you know, this is typical. And, of course, all of these cults uh, uh, you have a problem with. And, of course, uh, same thing with major religions that steal from you and want you to donate, etc. Uh, for comic book realities, which are the major religions as well. So the whole idea is that we need to understand that and what's going on. So were these any great compulsions of her? It was just another business. Well... I contend this is a business. I'm not sure she knows anything. I still haven't heard a single profound or new comment come out of her mouth. 
She's not talking about things that are generally not known. She's saying nothing, and I'll find this out by reading her books in more detail. So it's hard for me to go into much detail there because I have not read her books. I'm not sure what she's saying in her books. But from what she states in interviews and stuff, uh, there certainly is zero profound there. And uh, she's still on the alien kick, but apparently uh, it's not a big enough kit where she's going to continue to pay her astronaut husband, who she knew for a few hours and married, and then sent him lots of money. But I told you why she did that. Now, you really have to look at that. Don't think that anything is what it appears to be or what makes sense or what's straightforward. Nada. So uh, that's important to understand. So what do you do after writing your little Hollywood stories? and proving to the publisher that you are someone that um, can sell books. Well, you get into a subject matter that you may be interested in or maybe is hot at that time. She had friends in this area, as I just mentioned, the Ramtha people, other people. Uh, living in Malibu in Southern California, where a lot of these uh, particular organizations were based or had great followings, um, she came into contact with them. She saw the popularity of the New Agey movements and how much these particularly women, Lynn Andrews, the uh, guru of the American Indians, um, was another one who made a fortune off of it and so forth. So I think this is very, very calculated by her. So she decided to test the waters by putting out a particular book on that. And of course, it sold very well. Now, she has sold of her all of her books uh, I just looked this up on the interweb. Um, 22 million books. 22 million. Nice bet, Shirley. Another calculated plotting, getting into things. And it paid off and paid off well, thanks to your connections and first giving your Hollywood book out that sold, and then all the connections that go with that and your mealy mouth praise of everything Hollywood, which doesn't even make sense. But it does make sense if you're virtually a kind of alleged whore to anything that can make you dough, and your untalented brother apparently was pushed along even though you couldn't get your daughter in there. Well, I have no use for him. Never thought that he was very uh, talented whatsoever. Hollywood pretty boy apparently was screwing everything that walked. Um, so the whole idea is that uh, these are the type of things that we have to look at and understand of what's going on in these areas. Very, very important that uh, people understand uh, what that is. So selling books, coming out as a New Ager, uh, particularly late in her career, pretty much was over when she was writing these books, by the way. She had a few other films after that, playing old women, and was able to get some uh, noting for it. People like her acting. She got into emotional crybaby parts. I think it was Terms of Endearment with... Uh, Jack uh, Nicholson, which got her some fame, but she was pretty old by then. She didn't have much to lose. Uh, so the point is she wrote these books at a time when there was a high energy for the new age, and this was catching on, and people were selling lots of books, and she jumped on that. Now, whether this was an interest or not, but even if it was, she's a hypocritical person who doesn't take care of anybody. She doesn't seem to have too many charities or other things. There's no Shirley MacLaine Center. There's no Shirley MacLaine Funds. She claims to help a few people um, on her website, and I went to uh, MacLaine's website, um, and they are it's kind of pitiful. But she claims uh, that uh, she supports these certain little groups, childhood diabetes. Other, I don't know what that means. She gives money to them, I'm assuming. Certainly there's no new age stuff listed there. There's no centers she's reporting, uh, supporting that I can see. Uh, she's helping some uh, dog places, but I don't see any great references to that. She has five or six dogs on her huge ranch. Uh, I don't know if she's now living in New Mexico or uh, Malibu or wherever it is. Um, and of course, she's even written an entire book on that. There's not a single picture, not a single reference to her daughter on her um, page because of the book that was written by her. So, but it just shows you what kind of a loving, forgiving New Ager she is. 
So instead of saying, I love my daughter, I'm sorry we have problems, I hope she does well in life, you ignore her. Well, there are some references to her in the book, supposedly, and I'll look for these. There certainly is absolutely zero on her website. Not a single picture, nothing. I think that speaks volumes about who Shirley MacLaine really is, and really what a petty little big mouth slob she is, who thought she got everywhere on her silver spoon pushed by a gold Mercedes, that she thinks she got somewhere on her own. She, like a lot of Hollywood people, unless there are other things going on and special gifts given for parts, which I wouldn't be surprised at all, she was very lucky. And she claims, well, I earned that because I was a good dancer. Well, I'll give you that, surely, that probably you were a good dancer. As I said, I have a problem with dancing. I don't find it to be anything other than a nuisance to watch and never do it um, personally. But we'll give you that you were a good dancer. But, you know, I've seen good dancers. I grew up in Hollywood in Los Angeles. I saw very talented singers, dancers, and actors who never got anywhere. They worked as waiters, never got a break. 98% of the Screen Actor Guild makes under $10,000 a year. You got lots of breaks for whatever reason you were watched, you were brought up through their little system, and this happens, and the people, this happens to lots of people for one reason or another, and they don't necessarily have to be talented. Robert Wagner was one of the worst actors ever. Yet, he's a very successful person. But when he started off, in particular, he was a horrible actor. He, he's okay now. But look at what pushed him. We go on and on, and we can note people who've made it who don't deserve to make it. So all of these things have to do with uh, being lucky in life in general. And this is true with a lot of people who get breaks. Who get, uh, this is, you could say, the same thing with uh, Bill Gates. And... Um, Steve Jobs. I mean, Jobs was given the mouse by, um, who was that company? It's a major company, I can't remember. But they, they, they made the actual mouse, but didn't know what to do with it. What do we do with this? Steve jo they showed it to Steve Jobs, and he took it and used it for his system. So, uh, I mean, this has happened with everybody. So if you look at it, there's a lot of luck involved. Well, you still have to be out there to be lucky. I mean, you can't sit on your couch and be lucky. But So you've got to give people credit there. But there is this whole aspect of life. And anybody who's really successful has been given a major break by somebody else. Somebody has helped those people by getting them in where they normally would never go. And that happened to her. But she was given a break by her parents who trained her, who were show business type people who wanted to get into show business. And they pushed her and sent her to dancing school, encouraged her since apparently the age of two. You weren't called the idiot like uh, your husband called your daughter as her nickname and didn't allow her to read because she was too stupid. No, you were sent to school after school, given break after break, and yes, you had to perform, just like the baseball player has to go to practice. Doesn't count. People who make it, and you made it, Shirley MacLaine, in your early 20s. It doesn't count. You never struggled. You never had other jobs. Yet you put your daughter through this and gave her no attention because you were too busy living in the ego. And of course, what's more egotistical than saying, I know what happens after you die. I'm in contact with extraterrestrials. I mean, isn't that the highest egotistical point you can take? And you can't really refute that person. You can't say, well, yeah, that's not right. You, you don't know what happens after death. Well, and you do know what happens after death? You know, I talk to extraterrestrials. I get information from there. And she was able to worm her way in to talk to the dummy llama, to all the presidents and rulers around the world, because she was this little girly cutesy pie, and I'm sure they all wanted to get in her pants anyway. Uh, but she was a celebrity, and everybody loves celebrities. So if you're the president of Argentina, uh, and she wants to meet you, well, you're going to meet her. After all, it's Shirley MacLaine. She's a little boo-boo. 
So this is how you worm your way in. And she made sure she did this all over the world. And she made sure she hasn't made any kind of criticisms of almost anybody. As a matter of fact, I never hear, hear her speak ill of anyone. And um, is that the real world? Come on. That's you playing the game. Even when you have millions, and of course at the sacrifice of others. So I'm not sure who went on with this uh, 60000 plus a month given to this guy who claimed to be an alien that she conveniently bought into and thought it was worth supporting and that for one reason or another, aliens or the government involved with them didn't have the money to pay this guy. Sounds to me to be quite the story. Quite the story. So it's hard to really say what's going on here in terms of truth or not truth. Um... In terms of what this means. Of course, as I said, when people write books like this, the core, core motive of it is they're doing it because they need the money. I'm not sure how, Carth uh, um, uh, how this cleanses your soul. I'm not sure how it helps you to write this down and say, well, I talked about it now, it's out of my system, I'm better. Some people say that's good, I don't think that's good, I think it's opening up old wounds, and I'm not sure there's anything that you benefit by doing this except making money from it and giving your side. And I'm afraid that money is important, and when you have someone who has hundreds of millions of dollars, lives in the lap of luxury, uh, as well as a father who has mansions and boats and houses all over the world, um, when you get absolutely nothing, well, it almost behooves you to come out with something like this. And if you have to doctor it a bit to make it a little more interesting for the public, a little creative license, well, that's all part of the game. And certainly not something to frown upon. It makes a more interesting story. But connecting all the pieces together, well, a lot of this does fit together. I mean, obviously, she isn't wealthy, her daughter. Shirley McLean is still not married to this day. She lives by herself, uh, writing books, making hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in her own little dreamland, and now is able to get away with it as she's established herself. She really doesn't come out and say much of anything when you listen to her interview. She denies having much contact with extraterrestrials in one interview, and then in another one says she's had contact. Uh, but she evaded this for years, saying all she saw was ships, crafts. I've seen these flying in the sky, particularly in Peru. Um, well, I don't know what that means. You and... Uh, a billion, maybe four billion people, half the people on this planet, most people on this planet see UFOs. I would say 90%. Now, I would say also of those 90%, uh, at least 80% of those are explainable uh, in terms of natural occurrences, military ships, etc. Uh, she's stating a ship, but there doesn't seem to be anything past that, at least not then. But, of course, there is a lot more in her books, and she goes into these things. But it's interesting how she did. she's afraid to come out to look too crazy in interviews because she wants to make sure she gets interviews. So she talks in a very low-key, non-descriptive, safe manner. Yeah, I saw a crash. Well, you and everybody else, that certainly is not something that you would condemn a person for. It's also not anything to give them credit for because we have no idea what those blips in the sky mean. Your interpretation of them, like your interpretation of the history of Japan, is about as good as toilet paper and should be used in the same way. Flushed. I don't believe anything that this woman interprets as anything of any value. And this is the problem with everyone. Who are they to detail or give an opinion on their personal experience? Now, if you're going to, you have to be a person of high consciousness, you have to be a person of low ego, and you have to be a lifelong researcher who's very neutral. Who does that? Well, virtually nobody. I do that, and I have the background. I can judge things, and I'm not putting ego or anything else involved with it. Certainly, Shirley MacLaine can be labeled as an egotistical maniac. Her uh, books and everything else are not to be valued at all. 
They're nothing more than her uneducated, primitive, egotistical, off-based opinion from someone who operates a pretty garbage life and who treats people in her family like trash to the end. Not that, oh, I was a busy little kid. I'm sorry, Saji. You know, we all do that, and rich people do all do that, by the way. They're all busy with their own lives, and they don't really care. They don't really need you. Uh, I don't even know why they have. Most of the time, children are had in rich families by the wives because this is their bank account. They have 18 years that this rich guy who could drop you at any time and it mean nothing to them has to pay you. And I agree with that. You should do that. But you are taking on a responsibility when you do that. Whether it's a dog or a pet or a goldfish, if you take something like that and use it, you're responsible for it and should do the right thing. And we all know what the right thing is, and that means you take care of it. Should they have given them millions of dollars? Well, I don't know, but she certainly had it. Certainly, you should support your children, at least through college. And if you have lots of money, it shouldn't be going to some fun somewhere or to building uh, and buying luxurious items. She actually bought a blouse on Rodeo Jive that uh, she mentioned for $3,000 while her daughter had nothing. That's pretty sad. So this is why you can't judge. And this is why you can't say that this person hasn't. This is the reason why I've read these. Where is she coming from? What is her background? What does she know about these subject matters that she likes to diarrhea babble mouth about? Well, she knows nothing and she's not a very good person. She can't really judge anything. It's all about me, myself, and I. She's a conniver. She got in with all the big boys, and I don't know how much she put out or not put out for that, but apparently she was smart enough to play the little girly game right down to her haircut. So what does all that mean? Well, that's why everyone has to be suspicious of everything. You believe nothing from any side of the aisle. Uh, this person you think has any kind of enlightenment? Well, I don't see so she has anything. And the fact that she may have gotten some, quote, information, well, what does that mean? Information is about the interpretation of it. You get this information, something is told to you, well, what does that mean? Well, you're putting it through your personal filter. And this is why people don't have any free choice, because you're brainwashed by your experiences. So you take your experiences and you put them in that particular fashion. So that's what it comes down to. Your experiences then filter through that. So something may have been said that was not meant like that at all, but you understood it as that because that's what you believe or want to believe. So needless to say here, this appears to be at this time, and certainly this is a shocking book uh, showing uh, the abuse of this child, which is pretty extreme, scarring her for life, destroying her for life. She passes this on to her husband. Uh, she passes this on to her children, and the cycle starts again, and for no reason except for the neglect, egotism, and downright evilness of the, the people, her so-called mother and father. And I see this so often, and it's really sad. But that's the hell plane we live in, people. Just another confirmation that money don't make you nothing. Of course, it does make your life easier, but you can't buy your way into consciousness, and you can't buy your way into being a good pe person. You can't take drugs and see the real world. What you are is what you are. And it's sad. Now, if you recognize this and you try and reach a higher state of gnosis and seek truth, well, that's another thing. But certainly none of the people in this story are seeking truth. If anything, they've contrived nothing but lies.